Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure today to welcome to McLean Hospital our visiting scholar, Dr. Macheri Kishavan. Um, for those of you who don't know him, Dr. Kishavan is the Stanley Cobb Professor of Psychiatry at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School. He's also Vice Chair for the Department's Public Psychiatry Division and a Senior Psychiatric Advisor for the Massachusetts Mental Health Center. He received his medical training in Mysore, India, where he graduated top of his university and his psychiatric training in India, Vienna, London, and Detroit. Um, his research is cl closely involved in understanding the biological basis of mental illnesses like schizophrenia and in early intervention using medical and psychosocial approaches. He's, um, his research has resulted in over 600 publications and four books. He's received numerous awards, and he is going to be speaking with us today on the neurobiology of early schizophrenia. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Kishaban. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Palmer, and uh, good afternoon. So uh, today I'm going to be covering a rather broad topic, uh, the content of which is uh, not unfamiliar to you, a lot of very important work on the neurobiology of schizophrenia happens at this institution. Um, and what I'm going to do, since uh, I see that there are a lot of uh, you know, uh, different kinds of disciplines here, including students and uh, you know, senior consultants and uh, uh, different uh, disciplines, I made this a kind of a broad ranging talk to kind of tell the story of what uh, uh, schizophrenia today uh, might represent um, in a kind of uh, broad-ranging way. I might um, jump from topic to topic uh, because it's such a broad territory. So if there are things that are um, kind of uh, uh, going too fast, stop me and uh, ask me. So um, I work at Mass Mental, that's at the top. Um, most of my work was done in Pittsburgh on the left there and uh, that time at Harvard, and that's where I live, and this is how my home re looked like yesterday, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so about schizophrenia, you know, from the beginning, I have thought of uh, schizophrenia in the lines of what uh, the fabled um, Indian um, elephant, uh, which is groped by six blind Indian men who, um, feel different parts of this elephant and come up with different interpretations. Um, someone who is uh, feeling the body might say it's the wall. Someone who is feeling the tail might say it's a rope. And uh, someone who is uh, feeling the trunk and might say it's the spear uh, and, and so forth. But the point of the matter is that um, you know schizophrenia is not very different. Even from the beginnings of my career, uh, schizophrenia like uh, lupus um, was thought to be a disease of theories, multiple theories, uh, ranging back even from my resident days. The popular theory was that it is due to a schizophrenogenic mother or the refrigerator mother and so forth. And then ideas like the, that schizophrenia is a sane response to an insane world, you know, this is all these anti-psychiatrists going back into the 1970s and 80s. Schizophrenia is a spiritual breakthrough, not a nervous breakdown, which is what uh, R.D. Lang used to say in the 1980s. And then there were some ide good ideas that have persisted, such as schizophrenia being a developmental insanity, which is an idea that goes back to uh, over 100 years ago, goes back to uh, mass mental days. That has persisted, and the idea that uh, schizophrenia has somehow to do with dopamine has persisted and the idea that schizophrenia may have an autoimmune phenomenon uh, is still around there as a possible idea. Um, now, how I got interested in the uh, field of schizophrenia research was because even as a medical student, it was most uh, unfathomable to me how someone who looks otherwise just fine begins to feel his thoughts are being stolen and he's hearing voices coming from somewhere. Um, and, and so forth. And as I got into residency, I first did some neurology almost a year, 
And my neurology professor was puzzled why I wanted to go into psychiatry. He said, uh, why don't you, you know, stay in neurology? So I persisted, and uh, I wanted to go into psychiatry. But he said, why don't you at least do some neurological research in psychiatry if you go into psychiatry? And so his field of interest was the so-called soft neurological science. So he, was, he would demonstrate how early dementia could be picked up by doing a bedside neurological examination, testing uh, primitive reflexes, like this one, which is uh, called the palmomental reflex. There are many reflexes, the frontal release signs, like the grasp reflex and the uh, sucking reflex and the palmomental reflex and so on. And what he taught me is that a simple test is you um, take a sharp object like a uh, key and you uh, scratch the thinner remnants of the palm and that leads to a twitching of the chin. So basically what is it? It is a developmental reflex. Normally infants have it. It's the part of a pain reflex. When you scratch the palm, the chin twitches. But as we grow into our childhood, the reflex disappears because of uh, the higher brain regions like frontal lobe myelinating. But later in life, if the frontal lobe begins to break down, these reflexes reappear. So my neurologist professor said, when you go into psychiatry, why don't you do a study of um, schizophrenic patients, the so-called functional psychosis, which is what they were called those days, and organic psychosis, and you can show that these reflexes will be present in the organic psychosis and will be absent in the schizophrenic patients. And then you can actually develop a neurological way of distinguishing these on the bedside. So lo and behold, me and a resident of mine those days, this was in Bangalore in India in uh, 1970s, late 1970s. So we had no IRB at that time. So we took a notebook and we went in the mental hospital from bed to bed and we scratched the palms of uh, 100 schizophrenia patients and 100 um, organic patients and 100 uh, healthy controls. Lo and behold, our finding was that the schizophrenia patients and the organic patients, uh, most of them, of them were as epilepsy or dementia or head injury, they did not differ at all. So to me, it was quite impressive that the so-called functional psychosis had a neurological kind of background to it, so which is what got me kind of interested in this overall field. So there are some things that we have learned over the course of the last uh, 100 years, some facts that just don't go away. And in order to understand this illness, we have to start with what we know and try to build st theories around that. Um, first of all, psychosis begins in adolescence, even though some of the premorbid impairments go back to early childhood. So when does schizophrenia actually begin? You know, one might argue that schizophrenia actually begins at or even before birth, whereas psychosis begins in adolescence. And the question is, why does psychosis have to wait almost 20 years before it begins? The second question is, uh, you know, we know that cognitive and negative symptoms underlie the disability in this illness, but we don't know what exactly causes these disabilities, um, negative symptoms and uh, cognitive impairments and so on. Thirdly, we have known for over a half a century that uh, dopamine blocking drugs are the only effective way of treating psychosis that we know so far. So when they block dopamine, they get psychosis to go away, but so psychosis must be involved in some, I mean, do, dopamine must be involved in some way. But then dopamine may not explain everything. So when patients ask us, what is the chemical imbalance I have, we don't have a very good answer to tell them. And also, why does why a given individual develop the illness. Uh, you know, patients might ask us, why me? Why did it happen to me? So the question of etiology becomes important as well. And also, we uh, increasingly believe that schizophrenia is highly heterogeneous and that the disease boundaries are blurred. And so is it one disease or are there many diseases? These are some of the key questions that, uh, that, that we face in this field. And uh, I try to think of uh, you know diseases in terms of what patients ask us and how do we explain. 
you know, when it is a patient who has a stroke or an epileptic illness, we explain to them, this is what exactly is happening in your brain, and this is what might be happening in terms of uh, the mechanisms. But in psychiatry, we rarely do that, but we can. And so I put together here a typical patient that we all see um, who raises all of these kinds of questions. So this young lady, uh, brought by her parents for poor concentration, uh, diagnosed as ADHD in childhood, some family stiff schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. As she gets into high school, she begins to socially withdraw. Her grades are declining, and she worries that her uh, classmates might be spreading evil rumors about her. And also, she occasionally hears some whispers, even though they're, she's not sure that they are real. And when she is a college freshman, um, she begins to experience an internal chatter in her head. Um, two voices commenting on her, and uh, she's convinced that they are from a chip implanted in her teeth uh, by a classmate. And so she confronts this classmate and assaults him and uh, gets involuntarily, involuntarily hospitalized. Five years later, she continues to have these hallucinations. She is unable to work and um, mostly sitting in her basement, very little motivation, um, does not care for her personal hygiene. Her diagnosis keeps shifting. Bipolar disorder this year, schizoaffective next year, schizophrenia the third year, and so forth. She is not convinced about her medications, why she needs to take, and she asks, what is the chemical imbalance she has in the brain? So these are the key questions she has. Why did I have this problem in my teenage years? How come? Um, everything seemed to be fine, but then I begin to have psychosis in adolescence. And what is this chemical imbalance that you kept, keep telling me? How come I can't you know, get on to work and relationships just like my classmates have been able to? And you say that I may have heritable illness, but what is it that is in my genes? And do I have one disease or do I have many diseases? So let's take each of these questions in turn. So why does this illness begin in adolescence? In order to understand the reasons why it begins in adolescence, it's important to first of all understand the biology of adolescence itself. First of all, uh, you know, the young lady that we just talked about has multiple phases of her illness. Schizophrenia is a phasic disease with a premorbid impairment. In her case, it was like attention problems. Uh, prodromal um, features, the prodromal phase or the clinical high risk state when the person begins to have social withdrawal and, uh, uh, you know, has declining grades and have subtle delusion-like phenomena and then the psychotic phase, and then recurrent relapses followed by a persistent, chronic, stable state. This is the overall course of this illness. And there is cognitive decline that happens typically between the premorbid to the psychotic phases of this illness. This is uh, Larry Seidman, my friend, uh, who passed away a few months ago, unfortunately, very unexpectedly. I learned a lot from him, and this is a classic slide from him where he put together the um, cognitive impairments on this vertical scale, which are effect sizes uh, in the pre-morbid phase, which is about half a standard deviation uh, below normal. In the prodromal phase, a little over a three-quarter standard deviation. In the first psychotic episode, about a one standard deviation. And a little over that in chronic schizophrenia patients. So what you see here is that the largest decline in cognition really happens in this period, which is what sets the stage for understanding the biology of the early course of this illness and also the rationale for neurobiology, uh, rationale for early interventions in this illness. So let's come back to healthy adolescence. What happens during normal adolescence? There are many changes that take place during this phase of our development. And first of all, in brain structure. 
And as this young girl becomes a young lady over the course of uh, you know, the t two decades or so, there is a progressive change in, his, in her brain. And as you see here, the brain becomes increasingly blue. The more blue it is, the more thin the cortex is. So you might wonder, why is the brain becoming more you know, uh, thin and, uh, at this age? It should be at my age that the brain should be atrophied. But there is a reason for that. <laughs> and the reason is that, and that's the cartoon of uh, multiple brain scans done um, sequentially um, in a group of children growing into adolescents, and uh, the gray matter thickness is uh, animated uh, over as a function of time. As you see here, the brain is progressively turning blue with increasing regions of the cortex becoming thinner, uh, thinner and thinner, about 40% reduction in cortical thickness during this period. So the reason for that is that we have a um, progressive sequential um, a phasic development of the brain where neurons are born at conception and as you proceed through development they proliferate and synapses sprout and a point comes where there are too many synapses making the brain inefficient and inefficient uh, synapses uh, just like big organizations have to prune out in order to become more efficient and of course uh, as they proliferate, they also migrate to, to different parts of the brain so that the um, frontal lobe neurons go to the frontal lobes and the uh, temporal lobe neurons to the temporal lobes and so forth. So they're, they're proliferated, they differentiate, and they migrate. And then comes the period during adolescence when unnecessary neurons become um, eliminated through a programmed synaptic elimination process, also called synaptic pruning. And the neurons that are pruned and conducting efficiently are the ones that need to conduct fast. And neurons that are insulated with, by myelin are more likely to conduct fa faster. And so for that reason, another process that takes place during adolescence is the myelination process. So the key processes during adolescence are synaptic pruning and myelination. And this is a slide on the left here from a classic neuropathology work done by Peter Hutton Locker, who showed that synapse density grows during early childhood, and then plateaus out for a brief period, and then during early adolescence to uh, early adulthood, there is a pruning process that, that takes place, which is what might explain how we, our brains, um, become more efficient and mature as we grow into our early adulthoods. So a very um, important paper that emerged in the 19, early 1980s was by Erwin Feinberg, <coughs> who argued that schizophrenia, which begins in adolescence, may have something to do with the way the brain evolves during adolescence. So he argued that there may be some abnormality in the process of programmed synaptic elimination by which too many or too few or the wrong synapses are eliminated, even though he said that we do not have a basis to um, choose among these possibilities. So and he even went on to say that there might be a bug in the genetic program that might lead to this kind of a excessive synaptic elimination but he didn't know at that time as to what those genetic uh, bugs might be. So that was a really a hypothesis that was far ahead of its time. And Erwin Feinberg, who is a good friend of mine, keeps telling me that nobody cited his paper for almost 15 years. And uh, I was fortunate at that time to, um, to review the literature and kind of revisit his hypothesis about 12 years later. And basically what we did was we looked at what happens in normal adolescence and contrast that to what happens in schizophrenia. What happens in normal adolescence is a reduction in synapse density, which you saw. The gray matter thickness decreases. <coughs> 
as you saw, the prefrontal metabolic rate winds down. And we had at that time also shown, and so had Erwin Feinberg, that this is the period when um, kids who have a lot of delta sleep, slow wave sleep, they begin to lose the amount of slow wave sleep, which is a reflection of the total mass of uh, river, you know, uh, simultaneously oscillating neurons. Um, and we also had shown through magnetic resonance spectroscopy studies that the rate of membrane phospholipid synthesis uh, in the prefrontal cortex is reduced during normal adolescence. What happens in schizophrenia? The same phenomena happen, but more so. The synapse density is lost or decrease substantially in this illness, which uh, David Lewis showed later. Uh, gray matter thickness is relatively reduced more so than con controls. There is hypofrontality or prefrontal metabolic rate is reduced. There, there is a reduction in delta sleep, which we had shown. And also, there is a um, reduction in the membrane phospholipid synthesis as measured by um, magnetic resonance spectroscopy studies. So whatever happens during normal adolescence tends to happen even more so in schizophrenia. So which uh, raises the question as to whether there is an exaggeration of the synaptic uh, pruning process, the red line there, which is what might uh, set the stage for a decreased overall synaptic mass in the brain that might account for the switch from a pre-psychotic to a psychotic state. And David Lewis, as I said, had shown around this time that compared to healthy neurons, this is what you see here with the synaptic, um, uh, the dendritic knobs from those axons. Uh, these are the schizophrenia neurons in the post, um, post brains. So there is a density reduction of the synapses that you do see in postmortem brain studies of schizophrenia. So the question then arises, um, how does our brain you know, eliminate the synapses? And um, how does it know that in adolescence we, um, we need to have a synaptic um, pruning process? So some years ago, the work done not far from here at uh, Children's Hospital, um, Boston Children's Hospital, um, came up with some important discoveries. better? Great. Um, so what was observed was that there are these um, microglia in the brain, which are like the inflammatory cells, uh, which bear um, certain proteins on their surface called complements. And normally, these uh, complement proteins are involved in phagocytosis, fighting external pathogens. But in peacetime, they have to have another job. So they're repurposed to serve as the scavengers for inactive synapses, synapses that are not regularly functioning by way of uh, uh, producing long-term potentiation. Um, those kinds of inactive synapses are identified as uh, unnecessary to be eliminated, and they give out this kind of eat, eat me signal and these activated glia uh, using their complement cascade of proteins um, eliminate those synapses. So keep that in your mind as you go forward. And of course, the um, synaptic um, pruning is not the only way in which the brain matures in terms of the emergence of uh, or the changes in brain plasticity. And at this very institution, it has been shown that there are other processes as well, which I'll come to in a moment. 
So this is the uh, this is a slide from um, Beth Stevens's lab at Boston Children's Hospital. What you see there is the red and the blue dots are the um, uh, are the synapses that are engulfed by these microglial cells. But this work, uh, which came very close by here from Beretta group, is that there are these perineuronal nets, which are extracellular matrix proteins, which are around the synaptic, uh, around the axon hillux, the red uh, nets there, and they might control the beginning and the end of uh, brain plasticity process during adolescence as well. So there are probably more than one process, uh, processes that are involved in determining when synaptic pruning begins and when it ends and so forth. Certainly the complement cascade is one of them and the perineural nets might be another. Moving on to uh, other phenomena that change during adolescence. Adolescence is also the period where when the, while the gray matter is being pruned out, there is also white matter that might be expanding. And the different brain regions that are functioning more efficiently now need to connect better and that connectivity expands during adolescence. This is another line of work that is beginning to show the critical aspect of uh, adolescence as a period of maturation. At a neurochemical level, adolescence is again extremely important because that's the period when the um, brain neurochemistry is fine-tuning itself. And there are these excitatory glutamatergic neurons which are the ones that begin to prune out during adolescence. Um, by, by, by contrast to that, there is another excitatory neurotransmitter system which also expands into the cortex during adolescence. So this is the neurotransmitter system that is involved in risk-taking behavior, in reward-oriented behavior, and in phenomena like love and so forth. Which one is that? Dopamine. So dopaminergic neurons grow their afferents into the cerebral cortex predominantly during adolescence as well. So adolescence is the period where there are a lot of excitatory neurotransmitter systems that are in place. So that raises the question, the adolescent brain is flowing with these excitatory neurotransmitters. Why is it that all teenagers are not psychotic? So that is, that's because there is another neurotransmitter system which serves as the brakes against these acceleratory uh, neurotransmitter systems. And uh, I'm sure you all know which one that is, GABA. So again, work from McLean has shown going back several years with Francine Bennis and others that GABA system is critically important as well in fine tuning our um, brain um, machinery over the course of uh, adolescence. So again, keep that in mind as we come back to it in a few minutes. So adolescent brain development is characterized by pruning as well as um, a fine tuning of its neurochemical machinery. So for that reason, this young man, the mother says, go to your room and stay until the frontal lobes keep forming. The important point is that the excitatory inhibitory balance takes time to establish. And the adolescent brain has an imbalance in this excitatory inhibitory systems. Too many accelerators, too much accelerators, and the brakes have not formed yet. So let's see what happens in schizophrenia. Um, first of all, we talked about the gray matter loss, and it's not something that you know starts when the illness begins. It's probably there much earlier than that. Uh, Vaibhav Devadkar in my group back in Pittsburgh showed that uh, uh, compared to healthy controls, the um, genetically at-risk adolescents have you know increased loss of gray matter already when they are in their teenage years. And this appears to worsen as the person goes through the prodromal phase. And this is a slide from um, the UCLA group um, and also from Naples. They're both finding the same observations that 
adolescents at clinical high risk for the disease, when they convert to psychosis, they show more prominent gray matter reductions. And even after the illness begins, there is a further loss of gray matter in the first few years of the illness. So there is this prog progressive process of uh, gray matter reduction, cortical thinning, that happens from anywhere in mid-adolescence through early ad adulthood. And clinical findings also show that, you know, uh, I, talk, I began this talk with soft neurological science. We did the study some years ago in first episode, uh, never treated schizophrenia patients. Compared to healthy controls, the frequency of soft neurological science, both motor and cognitive perceptual, is substantively higher. Um, and non-schizophrenic patients are intermediate. Cognition-wise, first episode psychosis patients Schizophrenia patients have the most prominent um, cognitive um, deficits. And there are, of course, these uh, gray matter reductions compared to healthy controls, and also the membrane phospholipid changes in the frontal lobe pre um, uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy studies. So let's come back to the other question that this young lady raised. She asked the question, why should I take the medicines? Can you? prove to me that I have a chemical imbalance. What is the chemical imbalance and so on? So that raises the question as to what do we know? We all know that there are multiple dopaminergic pathways in the brain, but uh, for uh, this purpose, it's very important to remember two of them. There is the limbic dopamine, which goes from the um, midbrain to the limbic regions like the amygdala and the hippocampus. Um, and the ventral striatum and so forth. And then there is the mesocortical dopamine, which goes from the midbrain to several regions of the neocortex. So these are the two important dopamine tracks to understand the basis of psychotic disorders. And for a long time, what we have thought is that there is too much of activity of the limbic dopaminergic system, which is what leads to an excessive presynaptic release of dopamine or an increased activity of the postsynaptic receptors. So that has been the kind of theory as long as I have been in psychiatry for the last 30 years. So this is the first theory, the theory, the old theory of uh, dopamine in schizophrenia, too much limbic dopamine. But what it doesn't explain is how do you understand negative symptoms? How do you understand cognitive impairments? And indeed, uh, in recent years, there has been evidence that there is evidence for um, uh, elevated dopaminergic function, not in terms of the receptor availability, as you see here. The receptor availability is fine, and the transporter availability is also fine. But the evidence coming from uh, many uh, studies, including the Motsley Hospital, and this is a meta-analysis here, showing that presynaptic striatal dopaminergic release function is increased in patients with psychotic disorders. So that seems to be increasingly uh, clear, that there is a dopamine problem. But as I said, dopamine doesn't explain everything, and it doesn't explain the negative symptoms and the cognitive impairments for sure. So that led to a revised theory by Danny Weinberger, who also used to be at Mass Mental when he was a resident. Um, he argued that there is the mesolimbic system and there is the mesocortical system. And he argued that the psychosis is due to excessive mesolimbic dopaminergic activity, whereas the um, Negative symptoms and cognitive impairment may be related to a, an underactivity of the mesocortical dopaminergic system because the dopaminergic system in the cortex is important for signal to noise ratio in the brain and it's important for the sharpening of the cognition. But then that again raises a question, how can we have two different kinds of neurochemical problem in the same brain? That does, just doesn't make sense. So the answer to that comes from this link between cortical dopamine and limbic dopamine and how 
are they regulating each other? So now we know that there is one neurotransmitter system, which is the most abundant neurotransmitter in the brain, that regulates the corticofugal, uh, the, the balance between cortical and limbic dopamine, so to speak. And which one is that? This is kind of the one neurotransmitter that glues the brain together, so to speak. Glues the higher brain with the lower brain, and so on. That's the glutamate. So that raises the question as to whether it is not just dopamine, not just the frontal and limbic dopamine, but perhaps the glutamatergic system that might be involved as well. And uh, many years ago, we argued that uh, there might be a biphasic kind of uh, glutamatergic problem, and there might be too little glutamatergic activity in the pre-morbid phase that predisposes to a phasic excessive activity of uh, glutamatergic neurons during psychotic episodes, which might in turn lead to an increased um, dopaminergic activity and in turn to psychosis. And indeed, studies are beginning to show that in psychotic individuals, acute phases of the illness, there is an overactivity, there is an increased release of glutamate in meta-analyses here. And we also found in familial high-risk individuals that the more psychotic they are, the more schizotypal symptoms, the higher the um, glutamatergic activity is in the brain. So we talked about glutamate and dopamine, but we also had talked earlier in the um, yin and yang of the brain, the excitatory and the inhibitory systems. So how do we reconcile a glutamater glutamatergic and dopaminergic problem um, without considering the, uh, the inhibitory system. So that has led to a number of studies as to whether there is primarily a GABA problem in this illness. And postmortem studies at McLean, uh, Francis and Bennis showed that many, going back many years. And more recently, PET scan studies, this is by David Lewis, showed that in antipsychotic naive schizophrenia patients, the binding of flumazenil, which is uh, one of these uh, uh, you know, GABA binding uh, receptor sites, they, the binding is increased in the antipsychotic naive first episode schizophrenia patients. So which might suggest that there might be primarily a deficit in GABA transmission to which there might be a compensatory excess of GABA A receptors, uh, which might then lead to um, psychotic disorders. So there may be a combination of a glutamatergic problem and a dopaminergic problem and a GABA problem. And this uh, slide summarizes the main model that there might be a, an MDA receptor hypofunction, which in turn uh, might be related to a GABA problem, which in turn might lead to a uh, mesolimbic dopaminergic excess and a mesocortical dopaminergic deficit, which explain the negative and cognitive symptoms on the one hand and psychosis on the other hand. So one needs to begin thinking of the chemical imbalance in schizophrenia as at least a tripartite problem, a glutamate problem and a dopamine problem and a GABA problem. Going to the, uh, young, our young lady's questions, she uh, raises the question, by aunt had schizophrenia and my brother has bipolar disorder. And so how do you make sense that I have schizophrenia? So that raises the question as to whether, uh, what exactly is she inheriting? And what are these genes really coding for? So many of you will recognize this plot. And you all know what this is. Um, certainly, you know, the Statue of Liberty here points to this being a you know, profile of Manhattan. So why is Manhattan important for psychiatry and for, you know, my talk? That's because the Manhattan plot is used to explain what happens to the different genes in this illness. Consider each of these buildings as the different genes on this uh, genome, which is from chromosome 1 to 23. And um, the, the height of these so the height of uh, 
the vertical axis is the significance value of how different these different genes are compared to uh, healthy people. And um, in order to identify the genes in this illness, we need to get larger and larger sample sizes. And in the early studies, there were only a few genes that were popping up as being significant in this illness. But as the size of the samples increased, one began to see some signals appearing more prominent. There was one signal that in particular around chromosome 6 that began to show um, a lot of highly significant findings. And as time went on and the sample sizes grew, that grew in further size, this empire state building, but also the number of genes began to pop up uh, to increasing numbers. And uh, so this uh, cartoon here, this, this slide shows the um, graph that here, what you see um, is the sample size being 10s, 20, 30, 40, 60,000 subjects. And the number of genes that pop up as being significant, the purple line here is schizophrenia. Uh, this is, I believe, um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And this is bipolar disorder. This is height. You know, any of these, the larger the sample size, the more number of genes you pick up because the genes, each one of them has very small effect sizes. And statisticians will tell you that to find something of a low effect size, you need large sample sizes to reduce the noise. And indeed, uh, now um, studies have shown that there are at least about 108 gene locations. And this Empire State Building hasn't gone away. It kept, keeps growing. And so people have wondered what exactly is that doing. And uh, it has been found uh, over, a, over the period of time that uh, this had a lot to do with immune molecules, and in particular, complement molecules. So why is complement important? We saw earlier that complements are important for synaptic pruning. So now the complements are an important part of the genetic anomaly that underlies schizophrenia. But not just that, um, it's also but a third of the genes that are implicated in schizophrenia also have something or the other to do with brain development, glutamate, and, and so forth. And um, many of you are familiar with this uh, paper by Ashwin Shaker uh, going back a year, showing that uh, the complement uh, protein expression is increased in postmodern brains of schizophrenia patients. And also, the more number of alleles of these complements uh, you have, the higher the risk for schizophrenia and so forth. And we have also found that uh, complement levels in the cerebrospinal fluid is, are increased in first episode schizophrenia patients and in chronic schizophrenia patients, and also in plasma. So this field is growing, even though I have to caution and say that uh, despite knowing that many of these genes being implicated in this illness, um, these these uh, genetic factors collectively explain only a small proportion of the etiology of this illness. And in our own B-SNP studies uh, that we um, carry out um, across multiple sites, and uh, we also collaborate with McLean about this, um, we have found that uh, many of these genes, including in inflammation genes, um, channel genes, and uh, glutamatergic genes are implicated in the various path uh, pathophysiological processes that uh, uh, occur in this illness. This young lady also um, is very disabled. Even, her, even though her psychosis is a little better, she still has a lot of negative symptoms. And why is it that she is so disabled is the other question. What causes this functional disability in this illness? It may be that, it, that dopamine is important. It may be that immune molecules are important. But that doesn't explain everything. There may be other processes that are involved as well. And it may be that pathophysiology of schizophrenia has multiple hits. There may be early um, hits to the brain integrity uh, when the brain is forming in terms of impaired neurogenesis and migration and uh, synaptogenesis and gliogenesis and so forth. And then there may be a hit to the brain's uh, development during adolescence with an, with an excessive pruning and an abnormal myelination and a failure of plasticity. 
And there may be a further hit to the brain even after the illness begins through other processes like uh, um, myelin repair and cerebral housekeeping and glial support and so forth. And there may be multiple etiological factors that include um, infection, trauma, hypoxia, winter birth, urbanicity, malnutrition, substance abuse, psychosocial stress, they all take their own particular um, uh, toll uh, in causing what we call uh, schizophrenia. Relapses have their own contribution. We don't know whether medications themselves have some further effect on brain atrophy. Sub substance abuse and comorbid um, mood disorders may have their own um, consequences. Oxidative stress and neurotoxicity may play their role as well in the further pathogenesis of this illness. And uh, this is a review that we did with uh, Jeff Yao a few years ago. Um, and uh, you know, certainly oxidative stress, um, which is related to an imbalance between the pro-oxidant the anti and the antioxidant mechanisms in the brain, um, might have their own contribution. And uh, they may be related to genetic factors. They may also be related to lifestyle factors like smoking, diet, inflammation, viral infections, and so forth. So there are multiple processes that underlie pathophysiology of uh, what we call schizophrenia, which include glutamatergic, dopaminergic, GABAergic dysfunctions, inflammation, oxidative stress. So what we started off as an elephant, there may well be one elephant that explains all of these. Or there may not be, as I'll come to. So it's not, may not be so simple. Um, So this young lady asked the question again, what is my diagnosis? You know, you say it's schizoaffective disorder, and uh, last year I was told I have bipolar disorder. What is happening? So that has been a question that we have been very interested in, and it has led to this BSNP study that I just mentioned, uh, which is a, a um, large-scale study across the United States where we um, look at biomarkers across the entire psychosis spectrum, schizophrenia, bipolar, and schizoaffective disorder. And our goal is to see whether biology uh, maps on to these DSM categories or not. And indeed, in the first phase of the study, we found that they did not. There were no differences across any of these biomarkers between uh, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, and psychotic bipolar disorders. So that led us to the question as to whether there may be a different way of classifying these disorders, the psychosis spectrum disorders. So we um, took an ap approach that is agnostic to DSM um, <coughs> biology and uh, using a number of uh, biomarkers that include electrophysiological and cognitive markers we used a machine learning kind of approach, k-means clustering analysis, and it came up with a classification that had no resemblance to DSM classification. And we, we came up with three categories, biotype one, two, and three. And I'll say here, May Hall, who is here, uh, in parallel has done very similar studies and had come up with very similar bioclusters. But May calls them by a different name. They're called bioclusters as opposed to the biotypes that uh, what BSNP found. And interestingly, the results are very similar. Um, the biotype one seems to have um, a lot of uh, gray matter loss and a lot of uh, uh, um, electrophysiological alterations in their uh, uh, you know, uh, evoked response potentials and so forth. Cognitive impairment is quite prominent. Um, and uh, biotype 2 has some moderate degree of cognitive impairment, but uh, their EEG and uh, ERP patterns show somewhat different clusters. They show somewhat exaggerated amplitudes of uh, evoked response potentials, and we call them the kind of no noisy brain. And then the biotype 3 really doesn't differ much from healthy controls. I reflect them in green here because um, they have the highest proportion of uh, cannabis exposure. 
And as I said, the biotypes do not read or map onto DSM. The, here what you see is the red is all schizophrenia patients, blue is all bipolar patients, and the green are schizoaffectives, and they are similarly distributed across the three biotypes. So um, we, the biotypes were um, constructed based on EEG and cognition. So we wanted to see whether other biomarkers which did not, um, which were not used in creation of these biotypes would uh, differ between these biotypes in a better way than DSM categories. So that would be kind of an external validation. And indeed, we found that gray matter density, as you see here in the patients, biotype one had diffuse brain abnormalities. Biotype two had predominantly anterior limbic and frontal abnormalities, and biotype three did not show much difference. And interestingly, the first degree relatives of biotype one looked like biotype one. First degree relatives of biotype two had more focal abnormalities similar to biotype two, and biotype three relatives looked similar to biotype three probands. So there's some kind of a internal validation from a genetic side as well. And uh, um, Cynthia Gimond from my group looked at hippocampal volume and shape and the sub, um, sub parcellation of the hippocampus. And this is how the three DSM groups look like. The more red it is, the more loss of uh, hippocampal volume and shape. And what you see with the biotypes, there is a much starker difference between biotype one and healthy controls. And biotype two and three don't seem to differ much. And another uh, line of work that uh, another postdoc in my group, Sinead Kelly, has been doing, using diffusion tensor imaging in collaboration with Marty Shenton and uh, Marek Kubicki, is that the diffusion tensor imaging uh, fractional anisotropator data show the maximum deficits in biotype one, as we would have predicted. But interestingly, the free water, which is a putative um, inflammatory marker in the brain, is most prominently increased in biotype two. So there may be some differences in pathophysiology across these biotypes as well. So really, the, this elephant, there may not be one elephant. There may be multiple different pathophysiological processes which may really point to different entities within what we call the schizophrenia spectrum disorder. And the term schizophrenia alone as one disease entity is probably any more, not tenable anymore. The journal that I edit, Schizophrenia Research, is now called Schizophrenia and Related Disorder Spectrum. It is a, it is a journal of this uh, schizophrenia psychosis spectrum disorders. In the same way, Schizophrenia Bulletin has changed its name as well. So that raises the importance of us uh, taking a stratified approach to uh, treatment. It may be that there are multiple targets for pathophysi of pathophysiology which may lead to, which may point to multiple different um, uh, treatment interventions which range from dopamine to GABA to glutamate to uh, cannabinoid, to um, ampokines, antioxidant, and anti-inflammatory agents, and so forth. So probably we need to use multiple uh, tools in order to treat this very complex spectrum of conditions. And we have to do so perhaps by selecting specific individuals who may respond to specific treatments. Um, and you know, that is really where the field needs to be going. I think the field might be optimistic because some of the uh, biological changes that we see, like the cortical atrophy, might be reversible, even with psychosocial treatment, as you see in this slide from our ongoing cognitive remediation work. Uh, what we find is that regions in the brain, such as the amygdala and the hippocampus and the fusiform gyrus, actually increase in their volume during uh, cognitive remediation treatment. So coming back to this slide, there are many tools for treatment available going back into the premorbid and the prodromal phase, both psychosocial and pharmacological, and not just dopaminergic blockers, but also other pharmacological agents, including uh, antioxidants and uh, perhaps anti-inflammatory treatments, GABA modulators, 
and glutamatergic modulators and so forth. It may also be possible to um, predict psychosis to some level of confidence using calculators such as what Naples has been developing. And we also developed a calculator in, for familial high-risk individuals that is Jaya Padmanabhan for my group. So the key points that I want to end with are number one, schizophrenia result, might result from a, um, an imbalance between excitatory and inhibitory um, systems in the brain um, leading to perhaps a, um, a state of heightened excitatory synaptic pruning um, that might lead to a certain crossing of threshold leading to psychosis. And secondly, structural and functional deficits in the brain um, might, might stem from multiple neurotransmitter systems, including dopamine, glutamate, GABA, and all of which you know, collaborate to um, produce a healthy brain. And when they don't collaborate in adolescence, that's might, what might lead to psychosis and other um, components of schizophrenia. From an etiological point of view, genes and environmental factors and their interactions are clearly to blame. In this talk, I have not talked much about environmental factors, but not to say they are any less important and we need to study them as well. And the genes might be are not just our dopamine genes. There is only one among the 108 that, uh, genes that recently been implicated in schizophrenia that has anything to do with dopamine. Um, glutamate, GABA, um, immune genes, channel genes, they might all be involved. And increasingly, we think of schizophrenia as not one disease. It's probably a combination of multiple entities. Um, and it is, it is critically important to look at the illness as, um, um, you know, in a stratified manner. So that uh, just like we do in the rest of medicine, whether it's cancer or joint disease, we need to use biomarkers to guide our treatments um, so that we um, uh, can set the stage for more effective interventions going forward and also set the stage for better ways of predicting outcome in our patients. And this, many people work with me, uh, both from Pittsburgh, uh, that's on the left, and the Boston team. And uh, you know, thanks to everyone for listening, and also thanks to my patients and uh, the found research foundations that have supported this. Um, they do not look uh, easily different. Um, psychosis severity does not differ. Maybe there are subtle variations, but that's not statistically significant. Hi. Um, I'm Franca Centurino. I direct the special clinic for uh, bipolar and schizophrenia here. So going forward, do you, for your patients, recommend when they are ready, when they come to us, they're already, you know, many years into the illnesses? <coughs> Excuse me. Will you recommend the anti-inflammatory antioxidants besides the usual and customary things yeah. we do? Um, I do not routinely recommend um, anti-inflammatory agents, um, but I, uh, when, when patients are not responding to treatments, I do occasionally use some antioxidants. Um, you know, the N style asp aspartate NAC, which is available in nutritional stores. There are some studies that are beginning to show some possible protective effect. It's called NAC, N acetyl cysteine, N acetyl cysteine. Um, well, I, I think the field is encouraging but not conclusive that uh, they are effective. Um, so there is work on aspirin, there is work on minocycline, um, but again, you know, um, the word is not conclusive. 
aspirin may work in psychosis, but the doses that you need are large enough that the side effects may be a problem, and so on. Yeah. Dr. Keshavan over here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned in type 3 that there's a higher incidence of cannabis use, and we know that uh, uh, cannabinoid use, especially during adolescence and, and sort of these formative years, does alter brain neurochemistry and development. But on the MRI you showed, there wasn't any highlighted areas of, of significant change in function. So I'm wondering in that uh, sort of schizoaffective uh, subtype, what diagnostic criteria might be included? What might that look like? How would we diagnose that if not based on MRI? Is it just symptoms alone? No, so the diagnosis doesn't seem to help us uh, in any way in terms of distinguishing the degree of dysfunction they have or the amount of gray matter loss and so on. It is true that the group three, biotype three, had more of an exposure to cannabis. Um, however, there were many pa patients there who were not cannabis exposed people either. So it, you cannot completely equate cannabis uh, as being the protective factor there. Uh, there's some literature that is kind of growing which suggests that uh, patients who have a schizophrenia-like illness but also have a cannabis exposure tend to be cognitively more intact. So there's possibly some, um, some, some reason to suspect that this group, which is kind of a milder variety of schizophrenia, may be the one that is related to, um, you know, the, they end up using more cannabis. But one could also equally argue that, uh, you know, uh, the, these are the people who would otherwise have not developed schizophrenia, but cannabis just brought them on, and they had a lower degree of vulnerability, which was just triggered by cannabis, and that's why they have a milder illness and so forth. Yeah, that's what I've seen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we'll take one more, if that's yeah. okay. It's actually a two-part question, <laughs> but so the biotypes are really interesting, do, and they spread across all the different diagnoses, so can can that be used to do early identification at all, and also can it be used to change the way you do treatment so that it's more successful across? Yeah, so those are important questions which are actually being pursued. Uh, in fact, May Hall has a first episode study in which she is uh, looking at biotypes from their first episode and following them. And you know, I think the results will tell us as to whether the biotypes can predict who are likely to require long-term treatment who are the ones that may have a more benign course and so forth. Also, whether uh, a given biotype may respond better to one or other treatment is a question for the future. We don't know the answer yet. Yeah. So with that, let's have a round of applause for Dr. Kishvan. Thank you very much.